Good morning, everyone. My Great. name is Heather McKamey, and I'm going to be your host today for this um, presentation, The Path to Academic and Career Success. Um, we, we have about an hour together, so we'll go through the material initially, and then towards the end, as mentioned by the moderator, we'll have time for um, questions and answers. So just go ahead and take down those notes as, as we're working through the material today. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, the path to academic and career success is the topic today. You are constantly, undoubtedly, um, developing new knowledge of yourself an understanding of the world around you and gaining a fundamental understanding of academics and co-curricular content that can be applied to your path after AVU. An awareness of your interests, your preferences, your strengths, and your values can drive your decision-making for the future. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that some learners do not achieve their educational goals even when they have the potential? Whether you need help forming an academic plan or choosing a career pathway, our integrated approach provides individual support that helps you flourish in your studies while helping you prepare a career that will bring you joy and satisfaction. We understand that all students look for the path to career and academic success. And for that, we present to you this webinar. In the webinar today, we will go over the following, recognizing your personal SWOT, navigating university resources, and creating effective strategies. So let's talk about conducting your own personal SWOT analysis. One of the most com common competitive analysis frameworks is the SWOT analysis. SWOT, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, helps highlight and uncover opportunities that aren't immediately apparent. This information is useful when preparing for interview questions about strengths and weaknesses and identifying areas that might otherwise reduce the chances of getting a job. To conduct a personal SWOT analysis, I want you to grab a piece of paper and a pen and answer the questions that we're gonna go through. After you finish, highlight some of your greatest strengths and prominent weaknesses and make a plan of action based on the information. So let's start with strengths, step one. The first step of the SWOT analysis is to highlight every relevant strength that you have. These can include your experiences, your education, your skills or circumstances that make you a valuable candidate. Try to focus on assets that set you apart from competitors. For example, if you're a graphic designer, proficiency in design software will not set you apart from others. Choose a unique skill or ability that will help you stand out. So let's go through a couple questions to help identify your strengths. Ask yourself, what are you an expert at? What is your favorite skill? What skill do you get the most compliments about? What abilities come easy to you? What skill are you most proud of? What areas do you notice others lacking in? And do you have any unique background? Write down those answers and that should help you identify some of your strengths. The second step in the SWOT analysis revolves around weaknesses. Once you've identified your strengths, begin highlighting your weaknesses. Though this exercise can be a bit of a challenge, do your best to be honest about your areas that could use some improvement. 
Acknowledging your shortcomings will help you prepare to answer questions about them and make plans to develop these areas. Let's walk through a couple questions to help you identify some of your weaknesses. First, what area has held you back in the past? What is your least favorite work-related task? Do you have any education gaps? Which areas do you get negative feedback? Do you have any bad habits that you have at work? And finally, what scares you most about your job? These should help you identify some of your weaknesses. Next, the third step in the SWOT analysis surrounds opportunities. Like your strengths, opportunities set you apart from your competitors. These assets can be network access, available technology, or any other advantage that you can use. If you're having a hard time coming up with opportunities, look at your strength list and identify areas that you could further develop. So ask yourself, do any of your skills lead to opportunities? Can you get trained in any missing skills? Do you have a strong network of contacts? Is there any upcoming tech that you could be trained in? And finally, are there any areas where you see others failing? These questions should help you identify some of your opportunities. And finally, the fourth step in the SWOT analysis surrounds threats. Threats are aspects of your career experience or qualifications that might hurt your chances of landing a job. These can include technology that you don't have experience with, bad references, or questionable work history. Identifying these threats is crucial in the interview preparation process. For each threat, you should brainstorm solutions. Ask yourself the following questions. Is your industry shrinking or growing? Does emerging technology threaten your job? Could any of your weaknesses lead to threats? And could new applicants perhaps be more qualified? This is a great exercise our students can use to help map out their future career paths. The key importance of SWOT analysis for a student is to help achieve a clear picture of where we stand. Besides the analysis also helps students to identify areas of improvement and help them set goals. During a SWOT analysis for oneself is not an easy task to complete and it requires a lot of thought, but once it's completed, the results can bring great rewards. So let's focus on more on the opportunities and strengths and do a deeper dive into this section of the SWOT analysis. Most students tend to spend a lot of time focusing on the weaknesses and challenges. For whatever reason, those get more attention a lot of times than our strengths. Um, educationists, however, believe that they should focus more, people should focus more on their strengths. This helps learners succeed in their academic life. A new model has been adopted in, in the academia and business worlds known as Sandwich, which is meant to help learners succeed by focusing on their strengths only. The Sandwich feedback technique is a popular three-step procedure to help managers who are not so comfortable with giving feedback to someone else, constructive feedback to someone else. The sandwich method consists of praise and then it's followed by the constructive feedback. And then it wraps up with more praise. In other words, the constructive feedback is sandwiched between 
the two praise points. The purported benefits of this technique are twofold. It softens the impact of the criticism or constructive feedback. And two, it gives that manager that's probably uncomfortable with um, giving the constructive feedback, it puts them at ease and allows them to, to more effectively discuss the problem. When we focus on developing our strengths, we grow faster than when trying to improve our weaknesses. Plus people who use their strengths are happier, less stressed and more confident. So if you're finding that you're consistently failing or falling short on your goals that you've set for yourself, it might be time to consider trying to improve what you're already strong with rather than focusing your efforts on getting better in the areas where you're weak. When someone says focus on your strengths, it's easy to read that as just do what you're good at and you don't need to really improve. But that's what we call a fixed mindset, believing that your talents are innate gifts. That's opposed to what we, what's known as a growth mindset. Growth mindset individuals believe that their talents can be developed. Both strengths and weaknesses can be improved and people with a growth mindset tend to achieve more than those with a fixed mindset because they put more energy into learning. In other words, people who believe they can improve put more effort into improving, which in turn helps them improve. So to grow professionally and personally, it's not enough to identify your strengths and use them. You also need to believe that those strengths can be improved. And focusing on strength rather than weaknesses will lead to more opportunities faster. So how do you find your strengths? It's sometimes it's hard to identify your strengths um, because they are so innate and it's something that you're good at. So you don't you don't really focus on those. So the first step in growing your strengths is to basically identify them. And it can be a tricky, tricky thing to identify your strengths. Weaknesses are obvious. You feel your weaknesses. Things like if you're asked to give a speech and you get very anxious um, because you don't like talking in front of people, or you're asked to document a process and you were never a strong writer. Those are all things that you feel as a weakness. Weaknesses oftentimes also carry vivid reminders of some past suffering. Exercising your strengths, on the other hand, tends to feel more like just kind of moving through your day-to-day -day life. That can make it hard to identify what it is that you're really good at. If you're not sure what your strengths are, here are some ways to identify them. First, just pay attention. Pay attention might seem like generic advice, but we sometimes ignore the signs of our strengths because we're so invested in improving our weaknesses. Next, think about how different activities make you feel. In his book, Go Put Your Strengths to Work, Marcus Buckingham says we often identify our strengths and weaknesses in the wrong way. We think of strengths as things we're good at and weaknesses we are things that we're bad at. But a better way to think of strengths and weaknesses, Buckingham argues, is to figure out what energizes us. Strengths make us feel strong and weaknesses make us feel weak. So he says one way to identify your strengths is to think about how activities make you feel. In his book, Buckingham gives the example of a man who, as a young boy, had some innate talent as a swimmer. His mom recognized that and immediately enrolled him on the swim team. He swam on the swim team for years and years and gained all kinds of awards and accolades, but he absolutely hated it. So when he got to high school, he quit the swim team and started pursuing something that he really loved, which was making music. It's definitely possible to be good at something that you hate doing, but that's not the type of strength that you necessarily want to improve. Next, you can do what's called crowdsourcing it. So crowdsourcing is a great way to have others tell you what your strengths are. So it might be hard for you to see your strengths, but people in your life probably can see them very clearly. Ask your friends, your family members, boss, coworkers, or a mentor that you have to tell you what they think your strengths are. Some people may be uncomfortable responding and that's okay, you'll have that. Others might give you feedback that's not very helpful. Like if your mom says, 
oh, you're good at everything. That's okay too, though. The goal is to identify that things that you would not have thought of on your own or to identify patterns of um, things that you're, are your strengths. Then consider how you respond. Do any of the strengths people report make you feel excited and energized when you exercise them? If so, these might be strengths that you want to build upon and grow. There's a, there's a technique that I tell some of the people that I coach. Um, I always ask them to, who's on your personal board of directors? And so if you, if you make your own board of directors, your own personal board of directors, that's kind of your built-in crowdsourcing. So it might be an old teacher that you had or a lifelong friend or somebody that you played sports with once upon a time. Um, these are all people on your personal board of directors. So when you're trying to identify your strengths, you can reach out to them and use them as your crowdsource. Finally, you wanna create a list of your accomplishments. In the Introvert's Career Guide, Jane Finkel recommends an exercise where you think of your proudest accomplishments to identify your interests, skills, and values. But the exercise is also a way to find your strengths. Think back over all the accomplishments that you're proud of. It could be something like you got a promotion at work, you got a book published, or you taught yourself how to change the alternator in your car. Think about the accomplishments that energized you. They don't necessarily have to be things that are on your resume, but then try to narrow down that list to three things. How to develop and grow your strengths. After you've identified your strengths, the next step is to create a plan of how you're going to grow those strengths. If the strengths you found were things that you haven't focused on before, but uncovered through the exercises above, your first step might be as simple as starting to learn more about them. You can start by taking an additional class or researching things online or going through online tutorials. Then you can move forward from there. It's more difficult to figure out how to grow your strengths when you've been actively using them for a while. You may feel like you're already proficient and there's no more room for growth, but there's always room for growth. Here are some ideas to consider. Think about constructive criticism you've received. You can be really good at something without being an expert. For example, if my greatest strength is writing and I'm always getting feedback from my editor or people that read my pieces, then, and it says, you're a great writer, but you're too formal, then there's room for me to improve and make my writing less formal. If you can't think of where you need to improve on your own, you can ask people that you work with for feedback or you can crowdsource it. People are usually more open to providing constructive criticism if you invite them to give you that, give you that feedback. So people won't often tell you um, constructive feedback that can, can help you continue to strengthen or mitigate some of your weaknesses. But if you give them an invitation to give you that feedback, they'll tend to give you honest and open feedback. Next. Develop a related skill. If you're truly an expert at what you do, another option is to develop related skills. So for example, if you're an excellent blogger, you could turn your attention to learning related fields like SEO or videography or graphic design. If you're a talented developer, you could learn project management to build your leadership skills. Learn something that will make you better at your core strength, even if that secondary skill never becomes a main area of focus for you. When developing complementary skills, it also helps to consider your long-term goals. What skills will you need to get the job that you want in five years? One way to figure this out is to browse the LinkedIn profiles of people who have jobs that you would like to have in the future. See what skills that they have that you don't. See what experience they have that you don't. You might even consider reaching out to these people and asking them if you can have a conversation about their skills and their past experiences. 
that might be helpful for you as you continue to grow your career. This is excellent advice um, to follow. I went back to school later in life um, to get my master's degree. And the reason I did that is because I knew I wanted to be a top level human resources executive at some point. And as I interviewed, even though I had the basic qualifications that were listed in the job advertisement, it was clear that the people that had master's degrees were getting the top level jobs. And not only were they have holding master's degrees in human resources, they actually held degrees in business administration. So they had a broader understanding of the total business and how the HR function fits into that. So really researching what other people had on LinkedIn prompted me to, to figure out that that was an opportunity for me and a weakness for me. And I went back to school to mitigate that. Next, you wanna use your strengths and go put your strengths to work. Buckingham notes that only 17% of people say that they spend most of their time at work playing to their strengths. While you might not be able to go to your boss and create your own role that solely focuses on your strengths, Buckingham suggests a couple things that you can do to utilize your strengths more. You can push the people at work towards your strengths and away from your weaknesses. You can push for more training around your strengths. Push for inclusion on teams or projects that could really use your skills and your strengths. Push to spend time with colleagues who share one of your strengths and even more adept than you are at applying it. At the beginning of every week, Buckingham says to think about ways you can use your strengths a little more than you did the previous week. By doing so, you can grow the percentage of time you spend on your strengths at work gradually over time. After all, the more you use your strengths at work, the more people will recognize you for those strengths. And they may even start coming to you anytime they need somebody that has your unique skill set. Finally, teach someone else. If you teach someone else, this will help you develop and grow your strengths. There's a concept known as protege effect, and people learn the material better when they have to teach what they've learned to others. People who expect to have to explain what they've learned do a better job of organizing their knowledge and recalling it. Plus, as they teach, they identify those knots and gaps in their own thinking. You can consider hiring an intern or taking on a mentee by walking some someone that's inexperienced through something you know inside and out, you may uncover things you didn't know as well as things that you did, things that you could improve upon or new ways to do things you thought you perfected a long time ago. Next, we want to talk about destructive weaknesses to avoid. Weaknesses must not be looked at with resentment. Recognizing your weaknesses and is the first step towards turning them into strengths. Let's discuss a few of the most common weaknesses found in students that hinder their academic growth. First and foremost is procrastination. Procrastination plagues every student's academic career. Purposely delaying your work to the last minute is called procrastination. It adds to the student's burden and it makes them so stressed out that they fail to carry out their tasks properly. So how do you overcome procrastination? First, do your homework as soon as you get it. Next, make a schedule and plan your activities. Third, prioritize what's important. Next, make sure to finish all your scheduled tasks for the day. And finally, turn off your cell phone and remove all the distractions. Another area to look at is a lack of focus. If you have a short attention span, then it might be more difficult for you to focus, focus on a task at hand. Lack of focus can make you fall behind your peers. However, as soon as you recognize that this week this might be a weakness of yours, you can work towards strengthening it. A couple tips to mitigate the lack of focus. So 
Number one, you can remove all sorts of distractions. Number two, divide the study material into shorter segments. Three, make time for exercise. And four, make sure your diet consists of good fats. So this is a tactic that I um, had to learn about myself. So lack of focus. I am not one that can study for um, hours on end. And so when I was in school, I had to basically, if I had a four chapter assignment that I had to get done in a week and write a paper, it was okay, I have to not procrastinate and I need to focus. So I'm only going to do one chapter a night and then I'm going to write my paper on the fifth day. And that actually saved me a lot of time because I didn't have to keep going back through the material for a lack of focus. As I was focusing on each chapter, it was a, I was able to comprehend it. And so um, knowing if you have a lack of focus and knowing how to deal with that and put measures in place will help you be a better student. Next, the destructive weaknesses to avoid is fear of failure. Students nowadays have a burden of their parents' expectations on top of their own crushing academic stress. Students fear of failure and letting their parents down, without a doubt. Ironically, this fear of failure leads them to, under, to, to underperform in their studies. Anxiety and stress clouds their minds, which slows down their learning process and halts their growth. A few suggestions to help overcome fear is communicate effectively, think positively, take breaks when you need them, and remember, failure does not define you. You can learn a lot from failure. Don't let it define you. Next, lack of enthusiasm. Lack of enthusiasm is often the culprit behind low grades. It may also be the reason behind a lack of focus. Students usually lack enthusiasm in their not so favorite subjects. Fortunately, this is not as big of a problem as it might seem. So a couple things that you can try to overcome a lack of enthusiasm. One is try developing an interest in the subject by making it a little more entertaining reward yourself for completing the task and motivate yourself to do better. I'll also add that another tactic that you can use is if you have a subject that you, you don't love, that you're not enthusiastic about, some people find it beneficial to do that task first, that assignment first for that class and save the class that they really love for their homework later on as a motivating factor. They feel good that they got finished with the with the subject that they're not enthusiastic about and they're looking forward to the subject that they love. Finally, disorganization is a topic that um, is very prevalent. So disorganization can make you your work seem more difficult than it really is. Disorganization can also cause procrastination. You must organize your tasks and your activities for each day. You should make a study plan you should make lists, put homework on a calendar, make a timetable and stick to it, and do the difficult work first. Our weaknesses make us human. We can overcome weaknesses by recognizing them and finding solutions. So let's talk a little bit about the resources that are available through AVU. Everyone at AVU wants you to have a great college experience and do your absolute best. We've probably, you've probably received a ton of information about the resources, about the university, and some of it you know, may have fallen through the cracks. So we're here to help be your virtual guide to some of those resources and to remind you of how you can use them to help you succeed. Let's talk first about career services. From the beginning of your academic journey and throughout your studies, we offer a range of tools and dedicated career support to help you help your personal and professional development and improve your employability. The Career Center provides students and alumni with services and resources to empower them as they make critical life decisions and pursue career success. You'll find a wealth of information 
and advice from our professional team to help you make career decisions, gain work experience, find student jobs, and improve your applications for work and further study. Definitely tap into career services. They usually have the pulse on what's going on. Um, the job market has changed dramatically um, since the, the pandemic and your career services will have the best resources for you. Next, the, the Student Advising Center. The Student Advising Center provides students with a quality learning centered experience that enables them to establish and fulfill their education, educational and their career goals. By facilitating an effective decision-making process regarding educational transfer and career goals, advisors promote appropriate course selection and assist students with referrals to internal and external resources and support services. A staff of academic and career advisors representing diverse educational and professional backgrounds is available to provide this service to you. And then last, the library. The library provides a higher level reading resource and academic study skills you need to succeed at the university. Because it's a higher level reading um, is at the heart of this, this is gonna be different than a library that you're probably used to that you've experienced in the past. The library has resources tailored to your program, which will enable you to read widely and use a range of resources, including books, ebooks, e journals, and more. And then creating an effective strategy. There are a couple key ingredients to creating an effective strategy. Here are some great tips when you're looking at creating your effective strategy. First, always be prepared for class. Complete your homework assignments before they're due. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Chances are if you have the questions, somebody else in your class has it too. You should be their hero and ask it because you'll get the answer that they're looking for as well. Practice time management. Some students choose to purchase a planner or agenda to help them kind of manage their important deadlines and keep track of their tasks. You can also use a calendar feature on your smartphone or tablet. Always save your draft and your work to multiple places. You can certainly save it on your computer, but also try to email the draft to yourself or save it in a program like Google Drive, just so there's multiple backups if anything happens to your computer you're not out of luck, you have, you have other resources to, to gain that draft. Understand the importance of a syllabus and refer back to it throughout the semester. The syllabus is a legally binding document between yourself and the instructor. Make sure you're aware of the specific course policies and the expectations. Don't let your social life take priority over your academic life. Social activities are certainly important and can add a great deal of enrichment to your college experience. However, remember that if you ultimately miss an event to complete an essay on time, that's gonna be a, gre a greater payoff than skipping an assignment to, hit, to go to a social event. Ultimately, you're there to earn a degree. Next, get to know your professor. Maintaining good communication with your instructor is critical. Don't feel intimidated. Feel free to message your instructor at any time if you have questions. As a student, I can tell you I was always intimidated to develop that rapport with my professor when I was in school. Fast forward to the time where I have been a professor, I much prefer to have a working rapport with my students so I can help them understand the material if they're struggling. I get, I get to know a little bit more about their learning um, preferences and how they learn best through that rapport that we've built. And so it actually makes me a better professor having that rapport with the students. And finally, know that embracing help from peer tutoring is about improving your skills and making you a successful student. Organizing peer tutoring sessions with some of your classmates does not mean that you're an inferior student. It actually means the opposite. It means that you care. It means that you wanna learn and that you wanna be the best that you possibly can be in that particular subject. 
So some key takeaways from our time together this morning. One is student success encompasses both educational and early career performance. Educational performance metrics include college grades, cumulative GPA, program persistence, degree attainment, and student retention. Relative to early career performance, student success is descriptive of early income and occupational prestige. However, these performance-based success metrics focus on what can be observed externally. The concept of student success is broader at the individual level in terms of one's own experiences and appraisals of success. The path to academic and career success is in the hands of our students. You decide what success means to you. You decide your personal SWOT and you decide what your strengths and opportunities are to focus on. Keep a goal in mind and work hard to achieve it. All right, so let's see if there are any questions that we might have. Um, I want to thank you, Heather, for your time and for this great presentation. And I also want to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, we're going to start with the Q&A, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so for this, you can either type your question in the chat box, or you may unmute and ask your question um, directly to your uh, uh, guest speaker. Uh, we'll take. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions. In the meantime, uh, if you can go to the next slide as well. Mm -hmm. uh, stay connected with AVU on social media. We are on every platform. Uh, we will be sharing this uh, re a recording of this webinar on our social media and website within uh, two weeks from today. So uh, connect with us to find this. Uh, recording of the webinar. Uh, you don't want to miss it. You can watch it as many times as you want to uh, watch. Um, and uh, for now, do we have any questions for uh, our guest speaker? Um, there's one question. Um, you mentioned uh, the LinkedIn uh, part, the slide. Um, to reach out to people on LinkedIn. What do you do if you get ghosted um, after sending a message to someone? So quite honestly, there's not much you can do other than to find somebody else to try to um, reach out to and have that connection. So I, I've, I've had that. I've had people reach out to me on LinkedIn that said that they're just trying to find somebody to talk to about, um, you know, a, a particular career path, or maybe my career path is something that they would like to follow as well. And they've had a hard time connecting with people just to have a simple conversation. Um, so persistence is key. If you get ghosted, you just have to keep trying and that'll speak to your tenacity and something that you can actually use to, um, tout that skill to your future employer that, you know, you just didn't give up. You kept going and you wanted to research and how to, you wanted to know how to get to your end goal and you didn't give up. And this is an example of how you did that. Great. Thank you. So, um, don't give up. Keep trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's this other question on, uh, you mentioned a little the programs at work. So how do you introduce a new program, a training program at work? And uh, do you start by getting um, your coworkers buy-in first or do you go directly to your boss? Uh, what do you recommend? Um, I think th the question is to introduce a new training program at your Best. place of employment. So I, I think first and foremost, you have to make sure that it's a program that it's not just what you want to do, but it's something that your organization needs, right? That there's a gap between what the performance should be and what um, is actually happening. 
it, that will be a much easier sell um, to get your training program approved if it's going to close that gap in the organization. So hopefully those align. It's something that you want to train on and it's something that the organization needs as well. I would always start with professional courtesy, going to your boss and talking to them about your vision for the training and, um, you know, getting their feedback. And then at the end of it, asking them the next steps, what are the next steps? What do you need me to do to keep this project moving forward? Cause I'm really excited about this and I'm really excited about making a difference to the organization. Great. Thank you. Um, one more question, how to overcome hesitation and, uh, be brave to take a step. I'm sorry, how to overcome, what was it? Hesitation. Hesitation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a hard one. I'm assuming it's hesitation to commit to a new adventure, commit to a new job, commit to looking for a new job, commit right. to going to school. Um, it's hard. You have to find courage. And I, I think if you start with where do you want to be ultimately, and then figuring out what resources, what tools you need in order to make, make it to that goal, then it becomes easier because your only other option is if, if you don't take those steps to, to change jobs, to commit to school, you're never, you're never going to, you're never going to meet your goal. So you have to identify what the goal is, identify what you need to do to get there and then jump in. Because if you don't, you're not, you're not going to make it to where, where you want to be. Thank you. Um, from your experience, uh, what advice do you give on balancing um, your just the life, school, work? How do you balance? Yeah, it's a lot. I'll be honest with you. If you're working and you're going to school, um, it, you know, when I was getting my master's, I had two little kids at home. I worked full time and traveled and there were many, many mornings that I was up at four o'clock in the morning, um, getting my homework done before my kids, um, got up, you know, that I had to get them to school. So, um, it, you, you just really have to schedule, you, you have to schedule almost every aspect of your life. Um, you have to schedule time for you to do your homework. You have to have your personal life on a schedule. You have to have your professional life on a schedule. Um, and you really should schedule time for yourself as well. So don't forget to schedule time to meditate, time to exercise, time to make food for yourself. So you're not, you know, eating out or going through, you know, uh, going to a restaurant that is not providing healthy options because all those things impact your ability to, you know, run the gauntlet, if you will, of getting your degree, working professionally, having a personal life and getting through all that. So time management is key. Um, but as you're doing your time management, make sure that you are, you are scheduling things for yourself and you are scheduling things for your family and for your personal life as well. Elaborating further on time management and organization, what's the best way to do so? Do you recommend having a physical calendar or what's your opinion on the like the calendar on your phone? Yeah, so I'm I'm a big believer in um in calendars and lists. It's it's how I run my life, um, to be honest with you. And it helps me from getting overwhelmed. Um, there have been times in my life and as I'm a I'm a professional coach for other people and they'll come to me and you can see them basically shut down because they're overwhelmed and they're so overwhelmed. They can't even get started. And so the first thing I have them do is make a list and nine times out of 10, after they've made the list of everything that they have to accomplish, they sit back and they look at it and they say, gosh, that's not as bad as, as I thought it was going to be. And so there's, there's something about putting a pen to paper and writing down what you have to do um, that helps you manage your time. 
The other thing, you know, there are definitely a million calendar apps on phones. I am, I am a paper person when it comes to a calendar. Um, I, I like to, on Sunday before my week is starting, I sit down, I look at everything I have to do for the week. I make sure it's on my calendar. Um, I spend about a half an hour just, you know, mentally prepping for the week ahead. So I know, you know, each day kind of what to expect and running through each day. So as things pop up during the week, I've already kind of, you know, burned that in my brain of what I have to do each day. So, and again, taking a pen and putting it to paper and writing it out on a calendar um, just helps it stick in your brain. Awesome, thank you.